Good morning. Good morning. <sighs> Second Sunday of Easter. Back to the regular schedule and uh, not having to dodge trains. And there's lots of light out there. We don't have to watch for deer so much. Or we, we don't have to peer in the darkness for them. We can see them in the light. So this morning we are using our service of the word from the blue book. And may we all be blessed as we worship and gather underneath our uh, opening hymn 376 in the ELW. Please stand. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The word is near you. Honor your lips and in your heart. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the word. Continue with our scripture song. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Great and wonderful are your deeds, O God. Good Lord. 
Lord be with you. And also with you. Now we turn to our prayer of the day. Let us pray. Almighty, Almighty and eternal God, the strength of those who believe and the hope of those who doubt, may we who have not seen have faith in you and receive the fullness of Christ's blessing, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our first lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Our first lesson comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 14a and 22 to 32. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, fellow Jews and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. If fellow Israelites, listen to what I have to say. Jesus of Nazareth, of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with deeds of power, wonder, and signs that God did through him among you. As you yourselves know, this man handed over to you according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of those of the, outside the law. But God raised him up having released him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will live in hope. For you will not abandon me, my, my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One experience corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of your gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidentially of our ancestor David that he both died <clears throat> and he was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying, he was, a not, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus, God, this Jesus God raised up, and of all that of us we are witness. Our psalm today is Psalm 16. And if the congregation would read the indented verse, please. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord. My good All my delight is in the godly that are in the land. Upon those who are noble the But those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. I will not pour out drink offerings to such gods. Never take their names upon my lips. O Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who are not. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me. I have set the Lord always before me, because God is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. I also shall rest in hope, for you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life in your presence.
The epistle reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 to 9. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and unto an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfaded, kept in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that, though perishable, is tested by fire, and may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him, and rejoice with the indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Here ends our readings. Turn to hymn number 389 in the Red Book. Gospel acclamation.
gospel lesson for this second Sunday of Easter is taken from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter, beginning at the 19th verse. Glory to you, o Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, was one of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house. And Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. We have a, a wealth in again in our readings here of things that could be talked about that we could consider. We start with that great sermon from Peter. Peter who, Simon Peter, bless his heart, always had something to say, usually something in, inappropriate or not quite fitting the occasion, but he always had something to say. And finally here, as he is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, Simon Peter speaks one of the greatest sermons ever preached. We are told that at the end of that sermon, 3,000 people came forward to the disciples wanting to join them and be followers of Jesus. I don't think Billy Graham beat that record. 3,000, that's an amazing, an amazing thing. But Simon Peter spoke from the spirit that filled him. And finally, he understood. It was in his bones what Jesus was doing. And what Jesus is doing is proclaiming something radically new. It is a message that really didn't appear before. And there's elements that were there. People knew some of these concepts, but Jesus put it together in a new way. John gives us this story of the resurrection. It is new. Now, there's the ascension. That's not new. Jesus going up into heaven to be with the Father, Nothing unexpected about that. Nothing really new. After all, we have the story of, I, of uh, Elijah and how Elijah was caught up in a whirlwind and carried up to God, carried up into the heavens. 
Only his robe was left behind for his disciple, the sign of authority that was passed to his disciple. Moses, we are told, and according to the tradition, was carried up to God. And that's why his grave was not found. God took him up into heaven. Enoch, the very first of these stories in our Bible, early, early in, in Genesis, Enoch walked in with God and he was not seen anymore because God took him, the righteous Enoch. So we have these people carried up into heaven. And it happens outside of the Jewish tradition, outside of our Bible as well. The story is told that as they burned his body on the funeral pyre, Caesar Augustus was seen rising in the, in the flames and in the smoke, and his figure rose up into heaven to be with Zeus. Ascension was a well-known story. The pharaohs built pyramids, and the earliest of those were step pyramids intended to be like a ladder going up to heaven. And the pharaoh would go up and ascend to be with Ra, the sun god, and then travel with the sun god's chariot, with the sun, across the sky in the day, and then go down to be with Osiris, the god of darkness and death, at night, and arise again each morning. That's an ascension story. So ascension was really nothing new. But what is new is the concept of resurrection. The whole idea of resurrection wasn't new either. It was believed by the Pharisees, not the Sadducees. They were skeptics. The Sadducees says, oh, you know, we, we live once and then we go to God and that's it. But the Pharisees believed in a resurrection, that God would raise from the dead, bring out of the graves all of those who'd been before, and they would stand before God in a great judgment. That was standard Pharisee fare. That was what Saul would have learned as a student of that school. The resurrection of the dead. And all injustice would be put to right at that time. Those who had seemed to have profited and gained by their injustice and their evil in this world would receive the proper re reward for their activities and those who had suffered and not been given anything good for their good and faithful life would be rewarded by God. Jesus took this proclamation up directly in his early ministry. And he followed in the footsteps of John. John was a proclaimer of this resurrection. And he had this program for how we would set right the wrongs in the world. How we would get rid of these Roman oppressors and once more dwell securely in the land. And John's plan was come out into the desert, fast and pray. Purify yourselves. Renew your relationship with God. And then, after you had fasted and prayed and were right, you would be washed in the waters of the Jordan and enter the promised land. So the people went out, we are told, into the desert. And that's where they would prepare and they would come across the Jordan, just as their ancestors had done, coming across the Jordan from Egypt, from exile, into the promised land. And John said, when we do this, God will show up, just as God showed up for our ancestors. And as God swept away the Canaanites and the Amalekites and all of those Jebusites and the people who dwelt in the land, so God will sweep away the Romans from in front of us. But John was arrested. John was executed. And John's disciples, well, many of them just melted away because clearly God was not going to show up in the way that they had hoped. But some of John's disciples followed Jesus. And Jesus took that message and said, John was the one who said, prepare the way. 
And I am here to tell you the way has come. God is here. You are expecting God to show up and set everything right. But God is expecting you to show up and set things right. That God is here. We don't have to wait for God to arrive. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is within you. It's not out there waiting to come. It's already here. We have God's spirit in us. And Jesus then went on to enact even more powerful a parable and story than John did. John's great thing was this powerful image of coming across the river into the promised land, just as the people of Israel did originally. But Jesus said, we come into the promised land not through walking in the desert and then crossing a river, but by going through death itself. And Jesus went through death into life. And he, as Paul said, is the first fruits of the resurrection. Yes, the resurrection happens at the end of days, but it's already started. It started here and now. We don't have to wait for God to begin to show up. God is here. There's a beautiful parable of this, so powerfully illustrated in C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. It is a deep, deep parable. And in that story, this Aslan, the lion, he's the son of the great emperor across the water, the son of God. Aslan, the lion, is the one that they call on for deliverance. And Aslan shows up. But it's not what they expected. Aslan shows up. And in the middle of his arrival, there's this drama going on as he's appearing quietly in the background. These children show up, and one of the four children betrays the other three. He goes to the dark, to the dark side, the one who's called the White Witch. He goes to the castle of the White Witch, and he sells them out for a box of chocolate a box of candy. Turkish delight, to be precise. Well, you know, that, that makes it a little more understandable. Turkish delight's pretty good. And this is enchanted Turkish delight. It's magic Turkish delight. And Edmund falls in love with the pleasures of that and the promise of this beautiful woman, this beautiful powerful figure and he wants more Turkish delight and he wants to go and live in the castle with the great and powerful beautiful king the queen and she promises him that he will be a prince all he has to do is get the other children so that's what he maneuvers to do but he finds out that he's being played all along and when he tries to get out of the deal that he has made with this devilish figure, she turns and reveals her true self. But Aslan the great lion intercedes and he goes to the white witch and we don't see the scene, but he offers her a deal that she accepts. And the next time we see them, they're gathered on the mountain of the table of judgment on the mountain of the law where are written the stories and the laws and the guidelines and the principles that keep the whole land together and what the white witch has, has made the deal of, that there has been a betrayal and when there is a betrayal that betrayer must die 
there must be blood. And Aslan the great lion has just said, I will give myself in place of the betrayer. And your blood sacrifice will be satisfied. Well, the white witch is thrilled beyond all measure. Because Aslan, this great powerful figure, is the only one who's been able to oppose her and her desire to rule the world. And now she's going to finally get rid of that troublemaker. So she does. And Aslan dies upon the stone table of the law, satisfying the rule of the punishment for the betrayer. But that's not the end of the story. Because Aslan comes back. And he comes back as the sun rises on a Sunday morning. And as the sun touches the table, the table cracks and splits in two and Aslan appears. And the young girls who've come to tend to the body of their beloved king, their beloved Aslan, as they bury their faces in his living mane, they say, I don't understand what happened. How did you come back to life? We saw you die. We saw the white witch kill you. And Aslan says, she knew only what was written on the table. She knew only the surface of the law that sustains this place. But there is a deep magic, a deeper story she did not know about that when one who is innocent stands up in place of the betrayer, is willing to die for his friends, then begins an even deeper magic that cracks the law of punishment and death itself begins to work backwards. So in the story, Aslan asks them to climb on his back and they run through the country to go and intercept the final battle. And as they go, they see flowers springing up everywhere that Aslan's feet touch. And the snow that has been there for so, so long is melting before their eyes. And once more, spring comes to the land as this deep, deep magic at the foundation of reality, the magic deeper than the law begins to work death backwards. Christ is alive. The first fruits of those who live in God. And we are alive because of him. In us, life springs up. Hope springs up in us who so easily fall into despair. There is something much deeper than the surface of this world, than what appears to us. Retribution, the harsh justice of hatred, the divisions between us all, they are melting away in time as Christ strides across the world with these flowers of spring bounding out of the ground at each of his footsteps. Christ is alive. And because he is, we too shall live. And the story is not over. Amen. Let us join together in our hymn of the day, number 675.
In Christ you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We believe in him and are the seal of the promise of the Spirit. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Look forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, let us be reconciled to God and to one another. Gracious God, have mercy on us. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. Uphold us by your Spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. To the honor and glory of your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Sisters and brothers, rejoice. Mend your ways, encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Peace be with you. Live long and prosper. Share a sign of peace with one another as is appropriate and comfortable. At this time, we will receive our offerings. Gracious God, 
In the abundance of your steadfast love, you call us from death to life, from silence to speech, from idleness to action. With these gifts, we offer ourselves to you, and with the Church through all the ages, we give thanks for your saving love in Jesus Christ our Lord. As God's people call to love one another, let us pray for the needs of the church, the human family, and all the world. We give you thanks, O Lord God, for this day of rest, this day of proclamation, this day of resurrection. Now we gather on the first day of the week when you rose and showed us a new way of being. May we forever bless one another as we bless you for all you have done for us, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give you thanks that you are living and active in all the world and in so many places. We give you thanks for your grace and mercy and continued care of your people Israel. We ask your blessing upon people of faith all around the world, of many different faiths, for you speak to humanity with a voice that calls to love and care for all. May we take nothing and no one for granted, but always seek to find your grace and mercy with all people. Lord, in your mercy. We are aware, O oh Lord, that there is much brokenness in this world. We pray for those many places where there is strife and conflict. May there be leaders who rise up to proclaim justice with mercy and grace, that all people may come to rejoice and know that they live in a good world filled with grace and mercy that flows from you. And may we care for one another, especially where there is misunderstanding and fear, and may violence end for all people. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in our community who are struggling at this time. We pray for all of those in our nursing home. We pray for those we are aware of and those who are unaware of who are in hospital or in medical treatment. We lift up before you all those needs of which we are aware. And we name before you your servants. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for all those who've gone before us in faithful service following you and your way of love. May we be encouraged by the footsteps of the saints who've gone before us to walk in greater faithfulness to the end of our days. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant us, O God, for the sake of Christ, who died and rose again, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. people of the resurrection. May we rise with Christ, walk with him, and bring hope, deliverance, and joy everywhere we go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We turn to our closing hymn, number 722 in the blue book, 535 in the red book. And...
in white print on a black screen on the wall.